talk about not who gets rejected or how many get rejected. I'd like to talk about how many students actually get accepted, get admitted to college. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the 3,500 colleges and universities here in the U.S. and we're going to divide them into four categories. And if you're really perceptive, you'll notice there are four bullet points on the slide behind me. Okay, so we're going to have category A, schools that admit less than 25% of their applications. Category B, between 25 and 50%. Category C, between 50 and 75. And then category D, schools that admit over 75% of their applications. Of the 3,500 colleges here in the U.S., how many fall into that first category? How many admit less than 25%? Give me a guess. 30. 10. 10. I feel like I'm playing the prices right here. Someone's got to guess one, just so they can have the lowest number possible. Any other guesses? 50. Okay. Here's your list right here, 45 schools, some of whom you may have heard of. Like for instance, how many people have heard of Harvard University? I hear that's pretty good, right? How about Princeton? We've heard of Princeton, right? Okay, but how about this one? How many people in the room have heard of Jarvis Christian College in Hawkins, Texas? How about this one? How about College of the Ozarks in Lookout, Missouri? Okay, how about this one? And, and by the way, this is a real institution, okay? And my first exposure to this university was when I was a freshman in college and I was running cross country. And we went to a cross country meet and we lined up in our box and I looked over next to me, and I swear to you know what, the guy next to me was wearing a singlet, and it said, have you heard of, ready? Transylvania University. <laughs> Anyone know where it is? No. Lexington, Kentucky. Now, you got to understand, I'm a 17-year-old kid who's afraid of my own shadow, and I look over, and I'm like, dude, that guy's from, like, uh, from Transylvania. <laughs> He's tough. Talk about winning via intimidation, okay? 45 schools. How many schools do you think fall into that final category? Over 75%, how many? 60%, that's a pretty good guess. Here, hold on a second. There you go. Anyone heard of Baker College of Owasso, Michigan? It's on the list right there. I swear it exists. I've driven by it. So this idea, this idea, this myth that I hit something. Try it again. This idea. Testing, testing. This idea, this, this myth that is sometimes perpetuated by the American media that everyone gets rejected from college, it's not based in fact. So if you get to the point where you send off all your applications and you're worried you're going to get rejected everywhere, have faith. Now I will also tell you, I don't know, I'm allergic. If every school that you apply to lives here in that less than 25% category, you need to understand, you need to own that decision to opt in to that highly selective college environment, okay? You hear that noise? Someone tell me what that noise is. Yes. Here's the bad news. 
you are already on the clock. Everything you have done since you set foot in Livingston High School, whether that was a year ago, whether that was two years ago, whether that was two and a half years ago, it all counts. Believe it or not, we do look at your grades from ninth grade. Yes. So we look at a transcript, we see ninth grade, we see 10th grade, we see, we don't like white out ninth and 10th grade and just say, yeah, it's just kind of a warm up year or two years. No, no, no. It all counts. If you read the slide behind me, which year is the most important year? Why? This is the last full year we get to look at. In fact, if you really read the slide behind me, you will know when do you actually apply to college? Fall of your senior year. Which means, what do I not have the ability to look at? Senior grades. Which means a lot of the time, and at Gilbert, for probably 50 to 60% of the admission decisions we make, we don't see senior grades. We look at 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. So, if I can't look at your senior grades, what can I look at from your senior year? Someone said it. Come on. Your classes. Ready? Here's Andy Hint number one. You're going to get a lot of Andy Hints or Andy Tips over the course of the evening. Andy Hint number one. The quickest way to shoot yourself in the foot in this college application process is to have a solid looking curriculum in ninth grade, even stronger in 10th grade, even better in 11th grade, and then load up 12th grade with, you know, late arrival, early dismissal, basket weaving, underwater firefighting, billiards one, two, and three, and then your most rigorous class should not be, and I swear to gosh, I will see this on a college transcript at a high school transcript at some point in time. I do not want your most rigorous class to be AP weightlifting, okay? So your curriculum in 12th grade should look just like your curriculum from the earlier years, maybe even a little bit more rigorous. One of the questions I always get after this presentation is, hey Andy, I'm not a math person. I have finished my math requirement by the end of 11th grade. What do I do in 12th grade? And my answer is, if you're not a math person and you hate math, don't take a math class in 12th grade. Just don't blow off that class period. Fill it with another academic, another core subject in something you happen to be interested in and may want to pursue in college. One of the other questions I get is, Andy, I hate math, but I love art. What do I do? Take AP Studio Art instead of taking a math class. Okay? So don't blow off senior year, please. All right? Because we will spend a lot of time looking at your senior course schedule. And if we see great in ninth, 10th, 11th, and then a cupcake senior year, it's not good. Strike one right there. If there's one thing that I could leave you with tonight that you would remember, it's the phrase at the top, which is this process is a match to be made. It's not a prize to be won. Trust me, not only did I not dream of attending Earlham College my entire childhood, neither did my parents. Okay, They loved it. They thought it was a great place. But this is not a contest to put the fanciest sticker on the back of your car, okay? This is about finding a place that's the right match for you. And if you look at the phrase on the bottom of this slide, there are two key words. Someone tell me what those two key words are, please. Sure. Louder. Admission and, exactly. I am a runner. I've run many races. In fact, today is actually the 19th anniversary of the first time that I ran the Boston Marathon. And it's also the two-year anniversary of the bombings at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. So anyway, if we look at this in terms of a race mentality, in our society, I think we think this right here, admission, is the finish line. 
when really that's the starting line. We've become a little bit too fixated on getting in and not nearly as fixated enough on what am I going to take, what am I going to need to get out, to graduate. I'm going to make you guess what percent of college or university students here in the United States graduate in four years? Give me a guess. What percent? 65. Lower. 40. Higher. 40. About 40% of college or university students graduate in four years. Part of the issue is we're a little too focused on getting in and not nearly focused well, what am I going to need to get out? One question I'm guaranteed to ask every student I work with, and that is, what are the three things that are most important to you when you're thinking about college? A fancy sticker on the back of the car should not be one of those three things. Okay? Just a hint there. But you should be able to articulate what types of experiences you will need over the course of your four-year college experience. I'm contractually obligated to talk about this. Last night I was at Governor Livingston High School. I hear it's way more rampant up there than, or down there than it is here, correct? Our parents are all angels here. But I need to talk a little bit about the parental role in this process. And I frame this conversation again by telling a story. Imagine me at a college fair, and this happens at most every college fair that I work at. I'm behind the table, I have my Guilford banner, I have my Guilford stuff, and I can see this coming about 25 feet out from the table. And it's almost entirely driven by physical proximity. Now we have a parent and a student walking up to my table, and the parent is leading the charge. And the student is about a half step back, and students bear with me, because I know, I know what you're thinking in your head, because my mom and dad did this to me. You have that look on your face like, oh my gosh, they're going to do it again. And they come up to the table, and I can almost predict the phrase, which is, we are interested in learning about your psychology program, history program, whatever. And I'm a little bit sarcastic. I'm totally honest about that. And much of the time, depending on what mood I'm in, I go right back at them and I say, who's we, Kimosabi? Who's going to college here? So, this is a wonderful opportunity for us as adults to take that literal and figurative half step back and allow your son or daughter to take that half step forward and assert themselves into this process, to, it, to have a sense of ownership of it. And there are two very, very important reasons why. The first is holistic, the other is practical. Holistically, when your son or daughter gets to college, it is our expectation that they will be able to advocate for themselves in every possible way, in every possible setting. Issue with a roommate, issue with an RA, issue with their hall director, issue with a faculty member about an assignment. I have an issue or a question about the grade that I got on this paper. I have a question about the grade that I got in this class. These are all conversations that your student, your son or daughter, must be prepared to engage in effectively. Because we are prevented from discussing these things with you by federal law. If your son or daughter has zero experience advocating for themselves when they set foot on a college campus, we are setting them up for failure in terms of stepping into this role as an adult. So this is a great opportunity for us to give them a little practice. Okay, That's the holistic reason. The practical reason, which in this small context is way more important, is it looks better in the college admission process for the student